Hi everyone, this is SAT vocabulary list number six. Please take Cornell notes, write down any examples or underline any parts of words or root words that are gonna help you remember this list. And if at any point I'm going too fast, just pause the recording and take your time. The first word is abominate and it's a verb and it means to hate violently. So if you underline the A-T-E in abominate and the A-T-E in hate, it might help you remember what these words mean. But just when you're associating the word abominate with hate, know that it's to hate something violently. So it kind of takes hate to the next level in terms of intensity. A lot of people abominate Brussels sprouts. I ironically love them, but a lot of people do not like them and do not like them with a passion, like it's their least favorite vegetable. Um, so it's just an example of something to associate with the word abominate. The second word is anecdote. An anecdote is a noun, and it's a brief account of something, some event or some incident that is interesting. A synonym for the word an anecdote is a story. So if you're telling a short story um, to a friend, then you're telling them maybe an anecdote about your life or something happening with work. And so here's two images of two women sitting down chatting, and they're probably sharing anecdotes about their lives as they come together and have their coffee and their sparkling water. The third word is candid, and someone who is described, because this is an adjective, so it's a describing word, someone who's described as candid is very straightforward. So if you ask them a question, they're going to give you the honest answer, and sometimes it's painfully honest. So the people who are candid, sometimes they'll say things that can be can almost hurt feelings because they're being so truthful. An example might be Joan Rivers and her daughter. They're often at uh, Oscars in the Golden Globes, on the red carpet, asking people about their dresses, and they can be fairly candid about what they think about their outfit. But, you know, if Joan here was to ask me what I thought of what she's wearing in this picture, I might be candid and tell her that I think she went a little overboard on the jewelry. The fourth word is deterrent. Deterrent is an adjective, and it means hindering from action through fear. So kind of getting, stopping someone or something from doing something, usually people from doing an action, because there's a consequence or something that they fear that might happen to them. And I, I made deter blue because that's actually the verb form. To deter someone um, is the actual action of like hindering them from from acting um, through use of fear. And so I have a couple signs that are posted as deterrents to hopefully keep people from doing certain things. So here on the left-hand side, we have one of those machines where the arm comes down in a parking lot and you have to pay so the arm goes up and you can leave with your car. And clearly they don't want you standing underneath it because if it comes down and you don't see it coming down somehow, it could hit you in the head and that would hurt. So that's the deterrent. Um, the sign is hopefully to deter people, you know, be a deterrent so people don't stand underneath it. And here's uh, apparently a place where you're not allowed to load and there's a gun. And so that's a pretty uh, obvious deterrent. <laughs> Number five is fallible, and to be fallible is a describing word. It's to be capable of erring, and erring, think of error. So capable of making errors, making mistakes, and all people are fallible. Um, we're all capable of making mistakes, but I highlighted the word fall because usually when we fall, we don't mean to. It's an error. It's a mistake. We're being clumsy, um, but it might help you remember what this word means. And so here's an example, uh, somebody falling, clearly they don't mean to, and so they're demonstrating their own fallibility. They are fallible. They've clearly slipped off of what appears to be probably a dangerous little cliff. The sixth word is incite, and incite is a verb, and it means to rouse to a particular action. So if a person is trying to incite a group, another group of people to do something, they're probably trying to get them energized and excited or angry so that they want to act. They want to do something about it. So a lot of rallies take place before elections that really try to incite people um, to act, whether it's to get out and vote or whether it's to go door to door trying to convince people to vote for a certain candidate, but they're trying to incite them towards a particular action. And so a lot of times when people demonstrate for issues and causes, you'll they've, they've been incited to do so by somebody else. Somebody else has roused them to, to make a sign and go stand somewhere and have their point of view be known. Number seven is jargon, and it's a noun, and it's confused, unintelligible speech 
or highly technical speech. So any kind of speech or writing that is really technical, maybe it's specific to a certain group of people or it's so complicated that it's almost unintelligible, it's hard to even understand what's being said, is jargon. And sometimes when I listen to politicians talk, I feel like there's a lot of jargon. It's almost hard to understand what the heck they're talking about when they talk about the issues. Um, and But for a good example with my high school students is a lot of you guys say YOLO. And if I was a normal, like, adult, I might not know what YOLO stands for. But because I work with high school students, it makes sense to me. So it's not jargon. But for somebody else, it might seem unintelligible. It might seem like jargon. And a lot of professions have, you know, you think about the ed tech space or the technology space. There's a lot of words that if you're not in that space, if you're not in that profession, you're not going to know what's being said. And so this is a wordle with some, some jargon on it. The eighth word is muddle, and to muddle is to confuse or becloud either an issue or a topic or a conversation or to just kind of mess something up, to confuse it. Um, and people can be described as muddled, and the word even sounds kind of confused. The, the word muddle sounds like it, it's a great reminder of what the word means. And so I have this picture of this gentleman. Um, he looks like he could definitely muddle up a situation. Uh, it doesn't look like he's super uh, on top of things, or he looks a little confused himself. Number nine is perpetuate, and to perpetuate is a verb. It means to preserve from extinction or dying out or oblivion from just disappearing, right? And so to perpetuate is really just to keep something going. So lots of families perpetuate a tradition. They want to keep our tradition going from year to year. So anything that's ongoing from year to year, you know, we're perpetuating. We're, we're trying to keep it alive. We're trying to keep it going. Number 10 is refute, and it's a verb. And to refute means to prove to be wrong. So if you have two people who are debating an issue, um, either in a debate class or an election, um, a lot of times one person will say something and the next person will refute what they have said, which means they have either proven the statement false or the opinion that it has no grounds, but they're able to refute or basically prove that that other person's statement is not legitimate. And so debates are, are a good example to try to remember that word. Eleven is scarcity, and scarcity is a noun, and it's the inefficiency of a supply. So there's not enough of something it, it, that we need based on the demand. So there's more demand than there is a supply of whatever it is that is in demand. And so I can't think of scarcity, and, and the there's also the word scarce, it's part of this word, part of the this like the root word. Um, and so when you think of something that is scarce or there's not enough of, I think I always think of fossil fuels. So we're in an age where we're trying to transition to green energy, renewable energy, because there is a scarcity of fossil fuels. There are not enough given the demand. There's not enough oil. There's not enough coal. There's not enough of all these things on the planet to sustain our growing population and our growing demand. 12 is subservient, and the S-U-B here should be uh, underlined probably. That's a, a root that I've highlighted before, sub meaning below or under. So subservient is an adjective, and it describes someone who is servile. They are like a servant. They're excessively submissive. They listen and do exactly what they're told. They're humbly obedient, and usually someone is subservient because they have to be. Either they're of a lower status or they are they're employed by somebody else. And so they have to listen to what the other person is asking them to do. And when I think of people who are subservient, I often think of times when there's castles and knights and kings and queens. And even in this picture, the castle is huge and it's up in the, the top of the painting. And then down below it, the very subservient people who are working the land, right? The people who are submissive and humble and doing the job for the people above them. The 13th word is transient, and this can be both a noun and an adjective. Um, the noun form is one who is only of temporary existence. And basically we use the word transient as a synonym 
for homeless. And so when you hear people talk about transients, they're talking about homeless population in a particular city. And they're it, they're called transients because they move around, right? They don't have a home. They have to go wherever they can to get what they need to survive. So when you hear the word transients and it's the noun form, you're hearing about people who, who don't have a home. They move around. The adjective form describes something that only lasts for a short period of time. So it's temporary. 14 is virtual, and this describes anything that is being in essence or effect, but not in form or appearance. So everything you do online is virtual. It appears before you, these images, but they're not real. You can't reach into your computer and grab them. And so most of what you're doing online is virtual. It's there in appearance, but it's not there in actuality and form. And then the last word is efflorescence, which is a noun, and it is the state of flowering, the blooming, the actual state of the blooming of flowers. And so actually efflorescence in French means um, flowering out. And so that for people who know a second language, uh, the word, the F-L-O-R, floor, will sound like the word flower in other languages as well. And that's not a coincidence. So the flowering out, big blooming.